The Liberals tried to take control of the affordability agenda this week, rolling out announcements to build more homes and lower the price of food while sending grocery rebate checks to millions of Canadians. But their narrative got sideswiped by one of their own. Liberal MP Ken McDonald voted with the Conservatives to scrap the carbon tax. He then sat down with me to say the Liberal environmental plan is hurting his constituents and costing his party political support. Uh, everywhere I go, people come up to me and say, you know, we're losing uh, faith in the Liberal Party. Uh, they appreciate the fact that I've stood up now twice uh, to do away with a carbon tax or to ask for it to be delayed. All right, we're going to check the pulse of Canadian politics now in a week that also saw the election for Canada's first First Nations provincial premier and the election of the first black Canadian as Speaker of the House of Commons. I'm joined by Fred Delory, a partner at North Star Public Affairs and a former Conservative campaign manager. Melanie Richet, senior consultant at Earns Cliff Strategy and former director of communications for the New Democratic Party. And Greg McEachern with Can Strategies, who was a former Liberal ministerial staffer. All right, Fred, let's, let's get to... Ken McDonald speaking out against his party, a clip I have seen on conservative social feeds, <laughs> I have seen transcribed in a conservative news release, suddenly we're a very popular news source with the conservatives. Yes. What do you make of this move by the MP from Avalon? And you're going to see him a lot more, I'm sure, during an election as well. Uh, look, the, the conservatives set this up very well this week by putting a motion forth on the carbon tax. Really the plan is showing that they are the lone party that stands against it, putting the bloc, the Liberals and the NDP all together uh, that support it during this time of inflation and uh, pricing crisis that people are feeling. Uh, but to have a uh, this extra gift of a Liberal MP actually uh, voting with them and then going on your very show <laughs> and, and talking about how, uh, how bad this thing is to Canadians and even going as far as saying how people are losing faith in the Liberal Party is what he's been told from people he's talking to. Uh, that is, a, that is a, a big win for the Conservatives and you're going to see a lot of what he said a lot uh, during the election, I'm sure. Yes, uh, Mel, they, they jumped on it right away. Um, he, he, Ken McDonald didn't just say this was hard on his constituents, because there's two things here. Carbon tax, yes, there's a rebate. The clean fuel standard, there is no rebate. People in Atlantic Canada are eating that cost, and that's what's eating at the Liberal support. But he also said the environment minister shouldn't be selling environmental policy in Atlantic Canada. That's a problem. Right. It's totally a problem. And to Fred's point, the Conservatives laid a trap and he walked right into it. Um, and I think the only thing that or the only thing that happens with that is he's hurting his credibility in the riding. He's hurting his party's credibility and he's hurting um, he's hurting really his government while coming yeah. out and saying that. Uh, to your point, though, people are hurting and something needs to be done. A, a friend of mine in, in Newfoundland actually was saying that she could pay up to fifteen hundred dollars uh, a month. In, in having to pay to keep the lights on in her home, which is just unaffordable for, mm -hmm. for most people, right? So um, what can governments do to both um, face that in a real way so that constituents think that the government's taking affordability seriously without throwing your government under the bus and, by the way, you under the bus too because in the next election, you're still a liberal. Yeah, I, well, I'm not sure Ken McDonald's in credibility in Avalon, uh, Greg, because uh, th th there's a stubborn streak in politics back home. And, what? and uh, yeah, look, uh, uh, Google, Paul, Google Paul Lane. He's a member of the Newfoundland legislature who quit the Liberals, quit the con to go to the quit the Conservatives to go to the Liberals, and then quit the Liberals to sit as an Independent. And he's been reelected each time because he <laughs> took stands. Ken McDonald may be in that territory, and this is not comfortable territory, I would suspect. You you'll be shocked crowd. that we had a very similar case in Cape Breton at, <laughs> yeah. at one point. Yeah. Uh, so yes. F familiar. Um, so uh, let's not bury the lead here. The most important thing, I think, is that Pierre Polliver watches your show and, <laughs> and tweets about it, and the CBC may be saved. Um, but you know what? Whenever this happens, I get a kick out of it, because this is exactly what we supposedly want MPs to do, sure. to think independently. And about two weeks ago, there was a big uh, story that when there were some um, protests around the Hill, um, the memo went out from the opposition leader's office to tell everybody, don't say anything. And here you have a Liberal MP who is speaking his mind. And I don't think it's a surprise what he's saying about Liberal fortunes, because we've heard nothing but polling chat for weeks and weeks and weeks. Yeah. So, you know, I would say, you know, I'm not trying to shine the turn up here, but I would say there's an advantage here for the Liberals in that if, you know, I don't think they should and I don't think they will take super punitive action, action on, on McDonald because it shows that they have a caucus that, that's listening. And this is really close to the London caucus where there was supposed to be like some, some airing of grievances around things like this. Scott Sims lost a committee chair for disagreeing with his government, if you remember. I, I mean, do you think they'll take some action? Because um, 
you know, I, I, my phone blew up uh, from a lot of people from back home and here in Ottawa when McDonald was there and saying, he's going to get kicked out of caucus. I, I don't know if it you know, will happen. I mean, what's your there, sense? Of there it? may be some things, but there would not be the things that we as average citizens would notice, you know, in terms of who gets a visit maybe from, you know, a, a popular cabinet minister when there's a trip to Newfoundland. Right. There, there can be things like that. David, the other thing I'd say is, look, Atlantic Canadians have been very supportive of this government, but for some time there has not been a senior Atlantic Canadian advisor in the Prime Minister's office. Quebec Liberals would never put up with that. So I do find sometimes with Atlantic Canadian issues, PMO can be a little slow to understand what's going on. It's very different. I moved here. I couldn't believe heat was included with rent because back home, <laughs> struggling out of, you know, university, yeah. I'm pay trying to fill an oil tank with two roommates. So there are different you know, regions suffering different things. Yeah, the typical house has like a thousand liter tank and you put a 17 cent tax per liter on that. That's 175 bucks a tank you're at. You're adding on to this little clean fuel standard. And again, there's no rebate on that. But you know, Fred, um, how would Prime Minister Harper have dealt with a backbencher who criticized policy like this and, and uh, criticized, and Greg is laughing here, and criticized a cabinet minister like this saying, keep the guy out of, out of the region. Well, it's, it, I don't recall anything quite like that happening uh, with a guy staying in caucus uh, going mm. that far. The fact that he had to go out and do this, had, he had to come to your show to do this, to mm. blow off the steam. He couldn't do it internally, or, he, or they have, and no one's listening. That's a big problem internally that the Liberals clearly have here, uh, the fact that they have to go public like this and that aggressive on it. Again, saying that people are losing faith in the Liberal Party. You know, Mel, I, I do hear that, that there is a fix coming for this, right? And Ken McDonald said that last night, that he was promised by the Deputy Prime Minister when she was in Placentia, Newfoundland, uh, for a visit that, yeah, there's something coming here. Um, What's the solution? And how do you fix this without enraging Alberta, which has huge concerns about the clean energy regulations and, and, and other rural parts of Canada, unless it does become a nationwide policy approach? Right. And, and enraging anybody who actually cares about action on the climate crisis, right? Because those are the two um, audiences that you're also yep. trying to balance in that. Um, one of the proposals that, that the NDP put forward, and they think that they can get some good traction, and we saw, I believe the Conservatives also voted in favor of this when they brought it into the House, um, is removing the GST from a, as a first step um, in the Atlantic provinces. That would, that would help, mm. um, but, but we'll see if the government uh, picks up that, that baton. Um, and, and other measures, obviously, are important to face this. Things are tough. Things are expensive. So if in the absence of doing that, and to your point, there's no rebate um, on, on that second measure, what can the government do to help specifically folks in the Atlantic provinces that are really um, struggling more than, than folks um, outside? Right. Greg, the argument to keep hearing from, from politicians out east is, uh, look, the amount of people who burn oil in, in Atlantic Canada as a big picture for the Canadian emissions profile is small. Uh, but the impact of this is, on them is large and it could cost you seats there and you risk losing your entire environmental agenda if you lose the government, right? So, I mean, is that a valid argument? Is this a sort of you know, pressure point issue that, that they need to respond to? You know, it would be wise to pay attention to history. Um, the uh, number of seats in uh, Nova Scotia, for example, I believe is 11. Uh, all 11, Cretchen won in 93 and he lost all 11 in 97. Mm -hmm. um, so the tide can go in and the tide can go out. Uh, you ought to pay very close attention to it. And there's a bit of a precedent here when I say about the need for senior Atlantic Canadian advice. You know, I remember the government was very slow to call an inquiry into the massacre in Nova Scotia. Yep. You know, yep. that personally was quite an irritant for me. I remember saying so in social media and hearing from elected members thanking me for, you know, pushing that forward. So, you know, there's a bit of a broken telephone where there, there really shouldn't be. These issues are way too serious for that. Yeah, I, I remember speaking with someone in the government when that happened uh, and saying you got to go full inquiry and they said no this will work I said you can't give a small place the bare minimum when the worst thing has happened mm -hmm. you got to respond in, in the way that, that they clearly want okay uh, let's move on to our second topic here Greg uh, because the, we're going to talk about the Manitoba election mm -hmm. and uh, talk about tides coming in and tides going out uh, I guess that can happen in Manitoba. It's a little bit more inland than where we're from. Uh, but what's, what's your take on, on those election results? So uh, I, I see the, um, the you know, I, I paid attention to your interview earlier with the former cabinet minister in Manitoba, mm. you know, obviously, you know, very upset with the turn that her party took. And, you know, there's been a lot of coverage in recent days about how, I think you even asked the question whether or not this, who was the real Heather Stevenson here? Yep. The government uh, the, the former government now in, in Manitoba, the PCs, decided to make an election issue out of a search for bodies in a landfill. 
And I still, I think for years from now, um, political scientists, uh, students will be studying that. It reminded me of, of the tip line um, that the Harper government did. And that tip line costs, you know, for years afterwards, they were apologizing for it. The two people who did the, uh, the press conference that day were both had big leadership aspirations. Uh, Chris Alexander and Kelly Leach. Kelly Leach. They're gone. They're way off. And I think what's going to happen in Manitoba is that the government, the PC party will have to go into a convention. They'll have to talk about this, how this happened. And they'll be dealing with this for a while before they can even get up off the mat. And I say that, you know, as, as an, you know, kind of a, uh, something to watch for my federal liberal friends. Don't get desperate. Don't do stupid things that you're going to, you know, be paying for. You're going to lose and be paying for uh, in, in, in spite of that. I think the other part of that is a bit of a play is that going hardcore conservative, there was a huge rejection. I think people have looked at the federal polls and thinking that somehow the rejection right now that people, the anger around um, the Trudeau liberals means that they're angry about progressive policies. I think the Manitoba election shows that that's not true. Yeah, Fred, it was certainly the case that urban and suburban voters in Winnipeg uh, re rejected what happened there. But you know, you've run campaigns. Help me understand the choice there. Like, I, I can understand you've got a feasibility study that says this landfill search is going to be $180 million, a low chance of success, and there's a health risk to the searchers. Governing's about making hard choices. You can say, look, I'm sorry, but we just can't do this. Mm -hmm. But to put a billboard up, right, and, and to bring it up unprompted in a debate and make it, it, it in the city where these women were murdered and where their families live, like, What's that thought process behind that choice? I've been in a lot of campaigns, uh, yeah. some winning campaigns, some losing campaigns. I have no idea how you can come up with such a stupid idea. Uh, I don't know how you can get to that uh, that type of an outcome. Um, you're right to your point. Like maybe maybe there's a reason why not to do that, uh, but to campaign on it, to try to make it a, uh, a part of your one of your top three reasons to vote for you is ridiculous, yeah. and I don't see how that would ever work. Uh, that was a campaign that completely was dysfunctional. They had no plan. They had no real narrative. It was a complete mess. And I I would warn the the Liberal Party uh, federally here to uh, you know they're in a similar path where it seems like they have no narrative right now themselves and they're drifting on that way um, you know and again what what Greg said about you know hardcore conservative I think that it was hardcore stupid is what they did. <laughs> it wasn't hardcore conservative it was just I don't know what these guys were trying to do <laughs> that, 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 that's a good way to describe it Mel your quick take on that and then we'll get to your pick yeah uh, to, to your point like I don't know how that's your top three things that you're pushing or you're telling voters to vote free for um, I think what we saw was they tried to make this about uh, tapping into people's anger and instead of people responding in that way, um, the um, showing of hope in yeah. the Manitoba NDP campaign and with, with Wab Canoe is, is what people actually responded to. So I think that that's a lesson um, in Manitoba, but I think it's also a lesson in, in the next election that you can't just tap into people's anger. You have to propose stuff to make their lives better, and I think the Manitoba NDP did that real well. Just a quick point on that. I was in the room when Wab Canoe gave a speech, mm -hmm. and, and I said uh, to one of the NDP staffers that I knew, I said, I'm from St. John's. <laughs> I've never seen this many happy new Democrats in one place. Because they just don't <laughs> win, you know, in, in this sort of numbers uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador. But you've got a uh, kind of a hopeful pick and it's connected with what the, the two big choices made on Tuesday. Who would lead Manitoba and who would sit in the big chair in the House of Commons? Yeah, for sure. I think it was a, a really good week for representation and, and I don't want to say this as a, okay, check mark, now we're done, we don't need to do any more work, but um, the election of, of Greg Fergus as a speaker, as the as the first black speaker and I think in the G7 um, mm. was was really cool to see and then of course the the election of, of Wab Canoe as the first First Nations um, Provincial Premier is also really cool. He said something about how, you know, when, when his father was a young man, he wasn't able to vote, and now nope. his, uh, his son is the Premier of, of the province. So how, how cool um, for, for young kids across the country who um, can look at, at those two, uh, the Speaker and at, at, uh, at Premier Canoe or Premier Let Canoe, and see themselves mm -hmm. reflected. Um, and then there's also a, another, that a smaller news out of Manitoba, but the first um, transgender person was elected as, as a provincial MLA um, in Canada um, at either the federal or the provincial level. So in response to the, the, the anti-trans protests that we saw um, just a few weeks ago that we talked about on, on the show, um, to see that um, really just yeah. the hope and the... Um, 
uh, again, the reflection, the representation for people across the country to see to see those those three um, folks get elected is 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 just a really good moment in a time that sometimes doesn't feel uh, so hopeful. Yeah, and it shows how uh, things are changing in, in yeah. Canada, right? Where Justin Trudeau is like the oldest national leader of politics, <laughs> is you know just uh, evolving. We got about ninety seconds left. I don't want to shortchange it because this is an excellent point. But Greg, uh, your your thoughts? Uh, on yeah, I, I had a bit of, of a play of the week, and it was Canoe's speech, and when he talked about if he was asked about. When improvements started, you know, in his life, he said, yeah. it's when I stopped making excuses. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. Yeah, I looked at and, the opportunity. Yeah. And I hope that a lot of young men uh, listen to that message. I think about what we're bombarded with, the Jordan Petersons of the, of the world. And today when I was emailing Mason, the producer from a coffee shop, about what my picks would be, and I talked about that, I could hear two men talking about Canoe's speech. Yeah. And I think it was probably one of the best speeches I've ever heard in Canadian politics. And it really spoke. Yeah, and, and Freddie talked about the power of a second chance, right? And, and mm -hmm. you don't get a lot of second chances in life. And quite frankly, people who look like Wab Canoe in politics have never gotten a second chance, mm -hmm. and he took advantage of it on Tuesday. Yes, it was a, it was a very uh, pivotal moment, I think, in our country to see something like this happen. Um, Heather Stephenson, to her credit, the only good speech I think she gave in the entire <laughs> uh, campaign was when she lost, and she mentioned how you know she hopes future uh, Indigenous children can see him yeah. and what mm -hmm. he's done here. Yeah, she was very gracious in, in defeat. There's no question about it. And you know what? He also gives hope to CBC people because he used to have my old yes. job as a CBC reporter. And look, there can be life after public broadcasting. <laughs> All right, we've got to leave it there. I want to thank our, our, our panel, Melanie Richet, Fred Delory, and Greg McEachern. Guys, it's a great way to wrap the week. Thanks.